This is where established artists are really earning their money. So when you start off performing, expect to be getting fees of about £100 per show. You might get up to £500, so this is barely going to cover your costs, but it's all part of marketing, getting yourself out there, um, and, you know, and it's part practice as well. At a later date, you're going to start to get bigger festivals, bigger venues. Um, some festivals, such as Glastonbury, pay almost half what some of the other bigger branded festivals pay, mainly because they've got so many artists and also because of the kudos of playing at Glastonbury. Um, if you're going to play at, on some of the big stages at Reading, Leeds, you could be looking at anything from £50,000 up to £200,000 for that show. Glastonbury, it's going to be half that. Um, and then overseas, there's lots of festivals in Europe, um, Asia, Australia. Um, American festivals pay slightly less. Um, you know, it's all a matter of finding out where your, uh, where your fans are and where they want you to play. Venues like Hammersmith Apollo, Shepherd's Bush Empire, Brixton Academy, you're hiring an empty shell and you have to pay for all the production costs for that. And so that's going to be lighting, sound, the screen, the stage, set design, and you also need to pay for the busing and trucking to take your crew and all that equipment from venue to venue with you. So the production costs are gonna be really high. So when you do your own tour, you need to factor in all those expenses. Whereas when you do a festival, the stage is already set up. You still need to pay for the band, but you can essentially just rock up and perform. So the cost is gonna be much less for that type of thing. It's always a challenge because you need to try and put on a good show, but at a low cost. So it kind of conflicts with each other. Um, when I first started acting for DJs, I thought, this is great, there'll be no production costs. But actually, once you put the lasers and the confetti and the lights and so on, then actually the production costs can be even more than having a full band on stage. Um, so the important thing is to get a tour manager involved and to help that, get them to help budget and make sure that the costs are as low as possible and that you're happy with the result at the end of the day. I've got lots of clients who have made no money on those tours because whilst the fees have been good, the expenses have also been high and so they haven't actually made any profit. So you need to, it's be so important to do a budget straight away and to understand what, you know, what you're going to come out with because touring is hard work and you don't want to come out of it at the end and think, God, I worked really hard. Goodness, I didn't make any money. So sometimes artists choose to make lower profits because they want the production to look really good. And in, in turn, that can lead to maybe merchandise sales, more branding, so it leads to other income other than the tour itself. But for a lot of artists, they make most of their money from touring. So you have to make a profit. So that means you have to cut down. It means maybe not staying at a five-star hotel, staying at a three-star hotel, staying on a slightly less luxurious bus, having slightly less lights. And so a tour manager will really help put with that budget and make sure that the profit is as high as possible. I mean, I've had some clients that have called me and said, how much am I earning on to do this show? Because I don't want to do it. So tell me how much I'm making. And so for some people, that's the incentive to get out and get on that stage every night. Um, I've had some clients that have done huge amounts of touring and it is, it's not easy. And so if money is your motivation, then you need to know that you're making that money. Well, lots of artists can get extra money on tour from VIP packages, um, which could include a merch bundle. So they're quite popular now. And what a lot of the labels are doing to try and increase the sales of the album is that they're saying when you buy a ticket, you get your you get a free album involved as well, so that helps an artist go up higher in the album charts or the singles charts, because you're just going to buy a ticket, but you've actually also bought an album as well. So that can considerably impact the music charts as well. Um, so labels can use that as a bit of a strategy where they want to. Um, but you can also get extra income from VIP packages, um, which can also include a meet and greet. And even over lockdown, I saw artists do kind of meet and greets on Zoom um, and got quite a lot, of, you know, got quite a lot of income from that as well. So merchandise can be can be hugely lucrative. 
I act for Corrupt and a band that were called The Midnight Beast, who did really well from their merchandise relative to the other income that they were generating. And so it's a, it's a question of trying to find products that interest the fans. Um, and you can get very successful artists when no one's interested in the merchandise. So it doesn't always go hand in hand that the bigger you are, the with the bigger the merch. There's lots of artists that I act for that are just starting out that make probably 80% of their income from merchandise that they're just normally doing in their, their bedroom, you know, collecting orders, selling, you know, putting them in envelopes, sending them off. Um, and that can be a really good kind of way to earn income when you're just starting out. I've seen everything from kind of ashtrays and kind of quirky stuff to, um, Maximo Park did a did a beer. Um, Kygo have headphones. Um, you know, as long as as well as the normal kind of t-shirts and baseball hats. Sponsorship deals can be can give you lots of money, but they normally want quite a lot in return. And you need to make sure that you don't overlap with other brands. So if you do a deal with Nike, then you're not going to be able to do a deal with Adidas or Reebok. Um, so you need to make sure that you know what you're signing yourself in for and what level of commitment. And there's also a, a kind of contradiction with what the what your fans are going to want to see on social media. So if you're suddenly posting loads of ads every day, then that's going to lower your value and probably lose you fans. It's not going to it's not going to come across as authentic. Um, so it's trying to find a balance, but. Um, but a lot of the brands are really keen to link with music fans. Um, equally, there's lots of music fans wanting to connect with brands, so it's quite competitive out there. But if you can find your niche and find brands that particularly align with your values, then then there's good income to come from um, to come from that. I've had. Um, a, uh, a music artist had his birthday party paid for by one of the dating apps um, and, um, and, and lots of the kind of fashion brands are really keen to kind of expand their sales by getting, um, uh, by getting music artists involved. And Lily Allen did a vibrator, so there's lots of different ideas out there. I think you'd be starting off with maybe £5,000 for a kind of series of posts, depending on the number of follows, followers that you have. That would be the starting um, band. Um, and then I think it would be anything up to maybe £100,000, but that might also involve tickets to a concert or an appearance somewhere. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, and sometimes they can be more, but they tend to be kind of one year, two year, three year deals with the big brands. But certainly when you're starting out, if you can try and get a few five grand deals, you've got no costs involved with that. So unlike a show where you might do a performance, but you've got all the travel, hotels, crew to pay for. If you do a branding deal, you're probably not going to have any costs at all. So that's just 5,000 pounds of straight profit. So if you can do a few of those, again, that can really help build your, help build your finances up.